Dr. Tom Williams, Sierra Club Transportation Committee member and um, technical advisor to the Citizens Coalition for Safe Community. Basics. This town is the wrong project in the wrong place at the wrong time. The alternatives to the town have been much <clears throat> they developed so that they appear to be poor alternatives compared to the capacity of the town. Not equal cost, not equal performance, not equal equal bunch of things. So uh, we're going to be providing a new alternative that will deal with freight and with passenger cars and actually tell us how many trucks will be taken off the roads. We have also some concerns regarding environmental justice issues. At the last meeting there was an indication that it's only the LRT is elevated on the south end of the tunnel on the north end. Why? Now it's cheaper to go elevated than it is the tunnel. And wherever the action was, you get the money. Uh, the other one, for the south portal, there's only one option for the location. For the north, north tunnel portal, there are two. One is very distant from almost everything, and two, and the second one on Colorado, depending on which map you use. So there's some problems there. We're also concerned about the air quality and that there's no ventilation emissions limits standards provided for either the north end or the south end. And we don't know what, and this version <laughs> and scrubbers will really mean to the emissions. Okay, thank you. Sam? Sam, just before you start, um, I'd like to invite Robert Nelson up, please. Uh, next, thanks, go ahead, Sam. Sam Burgess, City of South Pasadena. I have two short comments. The first, uh, a reasonable, thorough, and objective study of the SR-710 cannot be made without a cost-benefit analysis. On numerous occasions, the public was assured that this analysis would be released at the same time as the PEIR DEIS. It has not. The 120-day comment clock should not begin until such time as the public release of the cost-benefit analysis. And the second comment, the Long Beach Freeway extends from the city of Long Beach in the south to Valley Boulevard, Long Boulevard in the north. There are two separate projects proposed for this freeway, the I-710 project and the SR-710 project. The SR-710 DEIR DEIS does not properly analyze or provide justification that indeed the SR-710 and the I-710 project projects are separate, not interrelated, and that one does not impact the other. In Orinda versus the Board of Supervisors, 1986, the California Court of Appeals ruled that a public agency is not permitted to subdivide a single project into smaller individual subprojects in order to avoid the responsibility of considering the environmental impact of the project as a whole. The I-710 and, and that's a unquote, excuse me. The I-710 and SR-710 projects should be studied as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
The tolls will also be made up of maintenance and operating costs. Why isn't that mentioned in the draft EIR? There is a poster in the map viewing area listing global large diameter tunnels that have been successfully excavated. Why aren't there any tunnels over 51 feet in diameter listed? The list includes Miami's 42 foot in diameter tunnel that's successful. Have you read the newspapers lately? The tunnel is leaking, the ventilation fans were disabled by unexpected vibrations, and bolts holding them also failed. The closest in size to the proposed SR-710 tunnel is the Seattle Tunnel at 57 and a half feet in diameter. It failed after boring 1,000 feet. Not mentioned in the draft EIR is a possible boring machine failure like the one in Seattle. What environmental impact would there be if that happened here? I ask all of you here today to Google Seattle Tunnel SR-99 and find out what can happen when a boring machine fails? Thank you. Thank you.
concerned, I think the seven pen uh, tunnel is a very bad idea. The thought of an accident in the tunnel, how can it be cleared? And what if there's a fire in the tunnel? I, it just doesn't compute with me. What I would like to suggest instead is that the money that would go into constructing such an enormous thing be spent on educating the public and getting them behind the idea of walking locally and of taking public transportation. And I like the idea of extending the, uh, the metro lines everywhere. The more we have, the more, the more we'll, you know, be able to use them. But another thing that came to mind was that perhaps if you offered an incentive to people not to drive their cars, but to take public transportation, maybe in the form of a tax credit of some kind, if they kept a record or had some kind of a punch card for the times they'd ridden, the, uh, the public transportation. Uh, there, there's got to be a way. People's pocketbooks are where you can reach them. And if there were a way of doing this, I think, and also educating how it saves on the wear and tear of your car. I mean, maybe there could be a credit um, against your uh, registration fee. It's just something that will get people behind the idea of cleaning up the air. Thank you.
as of 2020, uh, the, uh, there will be trains that go straight through from Long Beach to Pasadena and points east, even if we have none of these other projects going. I favor the, the projects that I mentioned. Uh, the freeway tunnel, uh, like many others, I have difficulties with. And the lady who talked about the how very wide uh, these tunnels are is on point. Um, also, I happen to check. I'm not that much of an online person. I like the world on um, that. <laughs> The 2015 World Almanac on page 728 has a list of land vehicular tunnels in the U.S. Uh, the number one is a tunnel in Whittier, Alaska, but it's for vehicles and trains take turns using the tunnel's one lane. Uh, after that, the next one is in Colorado, it's 9,000 feet. Uh, these are far in excess of that. We're going into uncharted territory, and we're, we're going into uncharted territory. There can be very bad consequences in the building of these of, 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 of the tunnels. Mr. Henderson, would you mind wrapping up your, your time? Right. Thank you. So, uh, is it another time or two? Or? Uh, I just need to have you wrap it up. Oh, okay. Thank you. Right. So, uh, the, 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 the conclusion is that we could have uh, all sorts of bad consequences in the uh, uh, construction. And would I be able to amplify to the court reporters? Absolutely. And if you'd like, you can go outside and I'll take additional comments. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then Joe Feinbach. Joe, if you could come up next, please. Go right ahead. Um, we need to have you speak a little closer to the microphone, please. Thank you, just so we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the uh, air quality, and um, because of that, read Caltrans Air Quality Assessment Report dated January 2015 about this project. Um, and it seemed to me to be weighted against consideration of public health and for the pro tunnel option, and as other people have, I'll take a quote. Um, the report said the results of such assessments would not be useful to decision makers who would need to weigh this information against project benefits, and then went on about what project benefits were. So I felt that the fact that a lot of the report talked about uh, higher than currently accepted levels of carbon monoxide, ozone, and particulate matter resulting in the um, freeway tunnel uh, being taken forward. Um, that, that wasn't, they said it, but then kind of took it back with uh, this comment that. Um, don't really think about that, just think about the benefits of building this tunnel. Um, like other speakers tonight, um, I'd like you to uh, think in 21st century, with the 21st century kind of vision, um, what, as a, a novice uh, reading reports, I keep seeing that no matter how many freeways we build, the cars come and they fill them. And the very first speaker um, tonight um, said that if we don't do something, we'll have what will amount to tremendously impacted congestion uh, down the line. Well, please, even, if you can wrap up your comments. Even if we build it, the tunnel, we will have congestion again. So I'd like to look toward a solution that some of the other speakers have talked about, like rail, um, things that will perhaps um, mitigate against global warming, against um, health impacts that will affect us all. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Joe, Jack, and also Joe, just a moment. Um, Edward Degramenti. Yes, the record, sir. I'm Joe Kahn, I live you know, in the northern part of Pasadena. And though I don't live near the route, I live in Southern California. Well, almost all my life I was born here. And in over 70 years, I've seen the demise of the rail trail system and the implementation of freeways as a solution to our transportation problem. I see most of the system built. In fact, while I was a student in 1963 in the summer, I was involved in uh, the survey to widen the Long Beach Freeway from two lanes to three. And at that time, traffic was light enough that you could actually walk back and forth across the freeway while doing the work. So, We've built and built and built, and we haven't solved any of our problems. As everyone in Pasadena knows, the 210 freeway did not end up with a smooth corridor for easy traffic. It has become more and more congested as it was extended to the 15. And so extending that freeway down south to the 710 is only going to make congestion worse. I think from my reaching at least on the summary analysis, I'm very disappointed that there seems to be a bias against the light rail alternative in terms of its impact. And I think that that alternative with perhaps improvements in design has the greatest possibility of being helpful to our area. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'd like to invite Mr. Paul Tell to come up. And if you wouldn't mind giving us your name as you come up, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, the name is Edward. I'm sorry, Dagger Mandy, architect and planner, firm in South Pasadena. What I've seen proposed here is if we're going to discuss planning, what you have presented is moving traffic and creating jobs. That's not in consideration of planning. Planning has to be in consideration of traffic as one, and people, and the environment as well. You've discussed the environment, you've given studies of these things, but you're going through a city, not only one city, but several cities that were never designed for, for the freeways. When everybody says South Pasadena, yes, it is a small city, 26,000 people. It's not a matter of should we be fair to punish Pasadena or East LA, should we now punish South Pasadena. So far, the proposals have been designed by Caltrans. Caltrans is, a, is employed by the state of California. They're told what to do. When you look at the freeways, you look at the master plan of the freeways to this day. Can you consider anybody planning a 210 freeway from one side of town and a 710 freeway from another side without really considering other than bisect in the city? That's not planning. That's just doing what we want to do because it's government, it's political. Now, when we talk about tunnels, there's a lot of problems, and everybody knows the problems. But we're talking about overhead transit. We don't want to talk about the aesthetic design, but the space, but the airspace. What is this going to look like? I know what it's going to look like. Major structures, not only out in space, but on the ground. That's going to take away certain highway lanes or street lanes. It's not going to just go up. The thing I'm saying is that, and I'll end it here. I realize everybody, and I spoke to some of the people who are employed here by Caltrans, and that's their opinion. They're not allowed to give an opinion. Aesthetics are very important. One thing to consider, not my firm, because I've already stayed in my firm. Maybe we have to hire some talented designers. 
I suspect that not only could you underground the entire light rail project, as was previously mentioned, but you could probably build us a water desalination plant and solve that problem too. So we must have some narrative consideration of use of funds, please. Thank you. Thank you. would be 
that area of importance. Behind Memorial Hospital, Old Town, uh, schools, and there was no information. What I want to know is what's going to happen to the patients in the hospital? What air are they going to breathe? Uh, what's going to happen to the employees who work there every day? What's going to happen to the people who go to Old Town? What's the air quality going to be like? There is no information. They have general information saying what it's going to be like in the region, but I want to know what's it going to be like for my patients who are in a hospital bed. What about the people who chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? What are they going to be breathing? And the, for $40 million, I expected that the DEIR would give us more specific information. I'm appalled at the lack of information in the DAR, and I think it's inadequate. I would like to know what's going to happen to the people who are in these areas. What's going to happen to Waverly School, the Sequoia School in Maranatha? These students are going to be right adjacent to the portal. I want more information. I think the study was done inadequately. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I was born and raised in East Los Angeles. As I review the EIR, I feel the anger of generations of East LA residents. Generations of having everyone else's unwanted projects dumped in our community. The 710, the 5, the 60, the 10. All of these freeways run through our community, polluting our air and destroying our health. Once again, East LA is being called to bear the burden of everyone else's transportation problems. Fifteen precious businesses will be taken for this light rail project. The draft EIR admits that once removed, these businesses will not be replaced. These businesses are counted on by our residents. They are within walking distance of hundreds of homes. The draft EIR states the local residents rely on these businesses and their displacement will adversely affect the community, character, and cohesion of East LA. Two of the businesses provide health care services. One provides physical therapy and exercise for those over 50. The other, dental services for children. East LA is a health professional shortage area. Removal of these services will hurt and jeopardize the well-being of our community, of our community's most vulnerable risk members, namely seniors and children. Almost three miles of this ugly, noisy project will run overhead through East LA. The draft EIR admits this project will have significant visual impacts. It will produce blight and separate residents from what has become East LA's heart, the East LA City Center. The light rail alternative will not relieve traffic. East LA residents use public transportation much more than other areas. East LA residents can already get to all the places that are destinations of this alternative, using buses and at rain pool We ask why. Why is this project being proposed? It's not in any existing, existing transportation master plan. It's costly and not funded. Could you please wrap up your comments, please? Thank you. Why is East LA a low income, 97% Latino community being handed ugly, noisy overhead light rail while mainly wealthy, non environmental justice communities get light rail in the tunnel? Thank you. Why does East LA have to be dumped on all the time? Thank you. Thank you.
And I have to raise my voice because what is a good man who means well and does nothing. So that's why I'm here. I have compassion for you, Los Angeles. What do I choose? And then you have a school that we don't really get in high school. Those kids are in the age that they're jumping and mom and you know, and then we have the golden line right there. It is going to be so narrow. And since they made that golden line, they didn't run the left or right. The lines are going to have all the time. You know, I think a block out of the way. We have blackouts. And you know, we don't have industrial side there. But then again, we have all the pollution from the freeways. And you know, we don't need it. We go on the golden line to cost the cost of the university. And it's not my daughter has asthma. I have asthma. My kids have my asthma. Uh, we 
either it's the groundwater that is the simulator on that property. Uh, we have two streams that go underground, about 10 feet. And we use that for uh, we have a Japanese garden. It has two large ponds, and those are refreshed by that water during winter rains. Uh, that lasts from approximately uh, early October through uh, May. And uh, that, that we're not using city water for uh, that period, uh, so we are helping our environment there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Go right ahead. My name is Mick Hansen. I'm the sub member from Pasadena. 
tunnel project. Uh, there, there is a problem with that. I set up this 26,000 page EIR, which is too long, uh, on my computer with a Boolean search program. I can find no reference in the EIR to any kind of contingency plan for any catastrophic failure of this tunnel boring machine. Now, this is new technology, and when I brought this up with the engineers, I attended their uh, session down in East Los Angeles. The engineer said it's uh, not possible that this would break down, even if it did, they could access the uh, shield of the tunnel, the face of the tunnel, from uh, inside the tunnel. Well, it did break down, it is possible, the same machine, the same prototype machine that's being proposed here is being used in Seattle. That machine has a broken. And the way that they had to access that was by digging down from the surface. And if you have to do that in the middle of a historic neighborhood like South Pasadena or Pasadena, you're going to have to dig a block wide hole in the earth to do that. And you're going to seriously disturb historic resources potentially and uh, other cultural resources. So I think that that is an inadequacy in the air. Uh, it's not addressed anywhere that I can find. And your engineers have to address it. Uh, it seems to me that you have to have a contingency plan for it. You can't ignore it. Thank you. Well, okay. There's one other thing. Can you do my then? Thank you. Yeah. You have a two-minute time limit on this. Now, I've been involved in many, many CEQA processes in my career. And when you have a two-minute time limit on an EIR that's 26,000 pages long, you're seriously suppressing the need for public comment. Because these people need to hear more about this. Thank you. My name is Anthony Portentino, and I've been involved uh, in following this process for well over a decade. And frankly, we shouldn't be here, based on the warranties and the promises that were made 10 years ago, to not be in this situation without first determining whether this was a feasible project. And as we all know, that's never been done. And two years ago, we were promised the cost benefit analysis on the record at a California Transportation Commission. Representatives of Caltrans and MTA stood up for the record and stated when the EIR would be released, a cost benefit analysis would also be released. Where's the cost benefit analysis? Where's the cost benefit analysis? Three of you are writing questions and answers down. How come we're not answering any of the questions of the speakers who are here tonight? How come we're not answering any of the questions? One thing that might be healthy for the process is as you write down all the questions at this meeting, next meeting, bring back all your answers. Or have experts at the meeting to answer the public's questions. Like, where's the cost benefit analysis that was promised on the record? Where's the cost benefit analysis? How do we know that this project has a benefit? And what is the cost? And finally, we're using a half a million dollars per mile as our cost estimate in the EIR. When a similar project in a different part of the state is using one billion dollars per mile. How is it that we're cutting it in half? How is it that we're cutting it in half and underestimating the true cost of this project by six billion dollars? <laughs> And one of the things that we need, one of the frustrations is there are projects, the Alameda Corridor East, the gold mine, there are public works projects that need our men and women working, and we're wasting our money on this project, and how many gray and black suits did we see here in this room, and how many people does it take to take notes and not answer questions?
study area was started more than half a century ago, but was never completed and not equipped to meet the growing population. Uh, what they forgot to add in that statement is it's an aging baby boom uh, population that um, they didn't take into consideration. I'm on the tail end, on the younger side of baby boomers, and already, because of health issues, I um, had to use public transportation when I was feeling well enough to be able to do it. And very, this was pre-Uber, so there, wasn't, there were not alternatives to be able to use to get me to my doctor's appointments, um, to, you know, go grocery shopping, do those kinds of things when I was uh, feeling better to be able to do those things. So really, um, the freeway toll tunnel and the no-bill don't address the needs of an aging population. Um, the alternatives that need to be considered are multimodal alternative that will help transport the movement of people, not, not the movement of uh, vehicles. Um, my speech is a little disjointed because I, I didn't really plan to, to speak tonight. But um, I'm a little, you know, when reading about even your slides here, reading the DEIR, um, the language is not plain language. You don't use normal English. There's a spin on many things where they refer to things like groundwater watering. Um, 3,000 million is actually 3 billion. Or PVE and PEIR times two, PVE, passenger vehicle equivalent times two is a truck. So, you it's know. Easy. Thank you. Do you want to wrap it
I just don't have to pay it. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to change my position and vote no on these proposals in the free market. Thank you. Thank you. Part of the team 
has conducted the studies that have found that getting within 500 meters of the freeway is very bad for children. It's bad for adults, but especially for children. And I think when you look at the tunnel, if you're looking at four and a half, or a little over four miles, and there's a, there's a 500 meter, four mile long zone of polluted air, and you concentrate that into two exit locations, you're going to produce absolutely unprecedented hotspots in Los Angeles. I don't think anything will violate it. The other thing is, if you look at how much of that air is actually polluted, typically to the pollution rates, I don't think you can move anywhere near that much air in, in this tunnel arrangement. And claim that you're going to be able to filter the air or use scrubbers, I, I don't think it's not typically done in these large tunnels. It may be physically impossible here. It's just a, a huge amount of air that would need to be cleaned. It would be extremely expensive. It would be an engineering feat in its own right. And I think the, the EIA is really short on those details. Uh, the costs, of course, are not there either. So I'm very skeptical that anything will be done to be able to mitigate what might be one of the or two of the worst air pollution hotspots in LA that we won't have yet. Okay, thank you.